our 30th anniversary for the Nashville Lawn and Garden Show. And next year, we're going to have a brand new facility. This, um, the old grandstand Victorian one burned in 1965. This was supposed to be temporary. So 55 years later, we're finally going to get a new um, facility. And if you leave as you're going out down the hill, you'll see them framing up right now. It's great big steel girders. There'll be three big halls all together. So we'll be all together in one big building. So that'll be exciting for next year, and we do appreciate you being here. This year's theme is Changing Times, Changing Gardens. We've got a great speaker's lineup, so come back if you can. We're trying something new this year, and we're filming three of our lectures to be posted up on YouTube, and this is one of them. So you guys are kind of be on TV a little bit. So hopefully you're good with that. So it's Jeremy Lekic. <laughs> I got it, Jeremy Lekic. Uh, Jeremy has been a good friend of the show. He's a terrific speaker. Last year he did a really fun garden in the front left, so you probably saw that. It's from Nashville Foodscapes. He's gonna talk to us today about converting your yard to an edible ecosystem, and I'm sure he'll take some questions also. So please help me make him welcome. Thank you very much. Actually, take this off. All right. So uh, my name is Jeremy Leckage. Um, I run Nashville Foodscapes. We are a design, build, landscaping company that focus on edible plants and creating uh, healthy ecosystems uh, all around Nashville. So uh, I'm going to start by reading a story from one of my favorite authors, Doug Elliott. He's a storyteller in Western North Carolina. And uh, this comes from his latest book, Swarm Tree, which is a book collection of short stories. And he recounts a hypothetical conversation. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Um, he recounts a hypothetical conversation between God and St. Francis on lawns. If you don't know who St. Francis is, you'll see his statue a lot in gardens. There's always a deer and bird. He was the saint of nature. Um, apparently, he was very well connected with uh, the plants and animals and other diversity of life. So this is a hypothetical conversation between God and St. Francis on lawn. God starts. Frank, you know all about gardens and nature. What in the world is going on down there in North America and all around the edges of those towns? What happened to the dandelion, thistles, nettles, violets, brambles, and other plants I started years ago? I had a perfect no-maintenance garden plan down there. You know, those plants grow in any type of soil. They withstand drought, and they multiply with abandon. Nectar from their blossoms attract butterflies and honeybees, and their seeds feed the birds. I expected to see a vast garden of colors by now, but all I see is little green rectangles. What's going on down there, Frank? It's the tribe that settled there, Lord. Tribe? Yes, Lord. You've heard of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Israelites? Well, these are the suburbanites. <laughs> yes, they started calling your flowers weeds, and they go to a great extent to kill them off and then replace them with grass. Grass? Why grass? It's boring. It's not colorful. It doesn't attract butterflies or birds or bees. Only grubs and sodworms. It's temperamental with temperatures. Do these suburbanites really like that grass growing there? Apparently so, Lord. They go to great pains to grow it and keep it green. They begin each spring by fertilizing the grass and poisoning any other plant that sprouts upon the lawn. Oh, well, these suburbanites must really like the spring rains and the cool weather that we provide. They must really like that because it makes the grass grow fast. That must make them happy, right? Well, not exactly, Lord. As soon as it grows a little, they cut it, sometimes twice a week. They cut it? Oh, do they feed animals with it and bale it for hay? Well, not exactly, Lord. They rake it up and they put it in bags. They bag it. Why is that? Is it a cash crop? Do they sell it? Well, no, just the opposite. They, uh, they pay to throw it away. Now, let me get this straight. They fertilize it so it will grow. Then when it grows, they cut it off, and then they pay to throw it away. That's right, Lord. Well, they must really appreciate it when we turn the heat up in the summer, right? When we cut back the rain, it gets hot and dry. That slows the growth of the grass, and that saves them a lot of work. They must like that. Well, you aren't going to believe this, Lord. When the grass stops growing so fast, they drag out hoses, and they pay more money to water it so they can continue to mow it and pay to get rid of it. Oh, nonsense. Well, at least I can see they kept some of the trees. That was a stroke of genius, if I do say so myself. Don't you love those trees? The trees grow leaves in the spring and provide beauty and shade in the summer. And in autumn, they turn bright colors, and the leaves fall to the ground to form a natural blanket to keep moisture in the soil and protect the seeds and the bushes. Plus, they rot, and it makes compost to enrich the soil. It's all a beautiful, natural circle of life, and is it? Isn't it? You better sit down, Lord. The suburbanites have drawn a new circle. As soon as the leaves fall, they rake them up, and then they pay to have them hauled away. No! What do they do to protect the shrubbery and the roots and the tender flower seeds? Well, you see, Lord, after throwing away your leaves, they go out and they buy this stuff called mulch, and then they haul it home and spread it in place of the leaves. Mulch? Where do they get the mulch? Well, you see, they cut down trees and grind them up, Lord. That's enough, Frank! 
I don't think I can think about this anymore. St. Catherine, you're in charge of arts and entertainment. Do you have a movie tonight? Dumb and Dumber, Lord. It's a movie about, never mind, I just heard the whole story. <laughs> so, the suburban lawnscape. Uh, so, long story short, the majority of land use in the suburbs is lawn. Now, lawn has its place. I'm not a total lawn hater. Um, but we don't have to look too far to see that um, the reason that we all believe, or that many Americans believe we need a nice lawn to fit in is because the same companies whose chemicals you have to buy to make that lawn look good are the same companies that put out that propaganda that said, hey, to have a nice lawn, you, I mean, you have to have a nice lawn to fit in. So, you know, I started to question, well, why? Why do we have, you know, lawns everywhere rather than edible landscapes, right? What is that? Where does that stem from? Well, from the ground up, right, we must go to the roots of that, which is culture, right? It's culture that dictates the environment that we see above ground, right? So this, these lawns that we see in these, these ornamental-only landscapes stem from culture. Now, I argue that we have a culture of consumption. How many people have seen this, right? So here are a bunch of logos. Many of you recognize them. Here are leaves. They've actually taken this to kids in urban and suburban communities and found that pretty much they get 100% on this part of the test and they get 0%, they fail this part of the test. So who's dictating our culture, right? So I've identified four pillars of culture. Uh, the first is traditions, right? Here's a picture of a great American tradition called Black Friday, where people stand in line to buy things at discounted sale. Um, of course, this, this tradition comes right after another great American tradition called Thanksgiving, right? Which, for the most part, is a beautiful tradition and originally started by Native people offering generosity to immigrants in need. So my dream is to eventually see mobs of people not standing in line to buy stuff, but standing in line with plates of food to offer to people in need. Stories, another pillar of culture. <clears throat> when I uh, decided that I wanted to help people grow, grow food in their yard in a beautiful way, I went to my grandfather and I said, Poppy, I want to be basically a farmer, right? I want to help people grow, grow food in their yard. And he was like, oh, no, you know? He wanted me to be a lawyer, a doctor, or an accountant. You know, he was a CPA himself. And, you know, that was mainly because he wanted me to have more money, more consumptive power. Um, eventually, he came around to it. Um, and so, rest in peace, Poppy. Um, but my dream is to have a kid go home and say, Mom, Dad, I want to be a farmer. And the, and the parents go, yay, we're going to be rich in good, clean food, right? Because agriculture, right, culture is right in there, important part of that word. Songs. How many people know the song? Way down yonder in the pawpaw -paw patch, picking up pawpaws, put them in your pocket, picking up pawpaws, put them in your pocket, picking up pawpaws, put them in your pocket, way down yonder in the pawpaw -paw patch. How many people know that song? Okay. Right? So, uh, 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 and actually a, a good amount of people, I've done that where nobody knows that song, right? And that's about the pawpaw, which I'm going to talk about later. It's basically our native mango. It's wild all around these forests. Now, how many people know the song, I wish I was an Oscar Mayer wiener, that's all I really want. How many people know that song? Oh, okay, everyone in the room. So one's about one of our wonderful native fruit and one's about a processed hot dog. Okay, dictating culture right there. Um, I've done this for a crowd where the, all the young people know the Oscar Mayer Wiener song and not one of them know the Papa song. That's sad. Um, right, language. So in English, which has become the language of merchants, up to 30% of the language are verbs, right? In a lot of indigenous languages, up to 70% of the language are verbs because the word for tree and mountain and ocean are verbs in indigenous languages. They're alive, they're animated, right? In English, it, it almost seems conscious or subconscious that we've, you know, itified things like trees and birds, so that it, we, we, we kind of disconnect from that relationship. So, um, so reculture, I feel like we're in a time of reculture, reclaiming our traditions, repairing our, our stories, renewing our songs, regenerating our language, having reverence for the diversity of life around us and remembering what it is to be human, right? So, I'm going to read one more passage from another book, Braiding Sweetgrass, um, I think one of the most important books of our time. Um, 
the honorable harvest, how we consume matters. So, because as humans, we must consume, right? We don't have a choice, we have to consume. It's not, well, do we consume or not consume? We have to consume. We can't photosynthesize. Plants are, they have that good gift. They can just take the sun and make food, but we can't do that. So she writes, whether we are foraging wild foods or going to the mall, how do we consume in a way that does justice to the lives that we take? In our oldest stories, we were reminded that this was a question of profound concern for our ancestors. When we rely deeply on other lives, there is an urgency to protect them. Our ancestors, who had so few material possessions, devoted a great deal of attention to this question, while we, who are drowning in possessions, scarcely give it a thought. The cultural landscape may have changed, but the conundrum has not. The need to resolve the inescapable tension between honoring life around us and taking it in order to live is part of being human. I think this is so important because here I am talking to you about food, right? Growing food in an endable landscape. And how do we consume food in a way that respects the life around us? Well, the edible landscape allows for consumption while restoring land, which I think is so important. Because if we can create agriculture systems that actually uh, provide habitat and life to all the other non-human uh, species around us, we actually are going to create a more healthy system, more resilient system for us humans as well. So the edible landscape allows us to consume food while also restoring land. But, as Robin writes later in the book, restoring land without restoring relationship is an empty, empty exercise. It is relationship that will endure and relationship that will sustain restored land. You see this when you see a farm, right? It's been in the family for generations. All of a sudden, the kids are not interested, and it gets sold into a subdivision called Pecan Grove Estates, right? And there's no pecans anymore, um, but it used to be. Right, so you see that, so that relationship has been severed with that land and now it's developed, right? And so it's these relationships that are really important for restoring land. This is a picture of my mother and my pa. My mother was going through a real rough time, lost her job, was very depressed. And I said, mom, let's make a garden together. So we got out, got our hands dirty. It, in a lot of ways, changed her life, right? Because all of a sudden, she was rebuilding a relationship with herself, with the land, with her husband and with me. And now they've moved out of the suburbs and are growing a lot more food on a lot more land. Um, so it's rebuilding those relationships. So lessons from the edible, edible landscape for our culture. Patience, right? As anyone who knows who gardens, patience is super important, right? When you plant that seed, you know it's gonna be a bit before you uh, reap the rewards of that, um, especially if it's a, a, a woody plant. Humility, right? So humility, humus, right? come from the same root. Um, so, and human, oh, sorry, humility, humus, which is soil, right, good soil, and human all come from the same root. So to be human is to be with the earth, to put your hands in the earth. Generosity, right, because these plants are so generous to offer this food, but also because a lot of times we have to be generous when the squirrels and the deer and the moles and all them get our food, right? So we have to be gener generous as well. And then reciprocity, because it's very much a give and take cycle with the edible landscape. All right, so where does this happen? Where can these edible landscapes happen? So I'm just gonna briefly go through some of the work we do and then I'm gonna get into the nitty gritty of, of how to do it. Um, so we've done designs in residential areas, farm scale, schools and libraries, churches, and military base. This is uh, Fort Campbell military base. So this can happen everywhere, and I hope it does, right? Um, so where do we start? I like to show this picture. This is Radnor Lake. Some of you may have been there. Um, the forest was my most significant teacher learning about the edible landscape because the forest is a very resilient ecosystem, right? How many people lived in Nashville during 2010, right? We had a huge flood and then we had a huge drought, right? During that huge flood, were, was, were we worried about the forest? Nope, forest was fine. It probably actually captured a bunch of topsoil from places upstream. And then when we had a drought two or three months later, did we have watering brigades going into the forest to make sure it stayed alive? Nope, it's a very resilient system. We used to have chestnuts all over our eastern forest. Well, they're trying to bring those back, but for a while, and still really for the most part, there are no chestnuts in our forest. But the forest still exists, right? It's a very resilient e ecosystem. So how do we bring that into our, e to our landscapes? How do we bring that into our food systems? <clears throat> so, a lot of it starts with soil. Actually, all of it starts with soil. 
Um, this is a yard over in West Nashville that we did a design for. And the client says, well, it's going to be probably five to seven years before I can install this entire design. What can we do now to prepare the ground for when we eventually do other things? So we ended up removing all of the, all of the grass, tilled in some compost, and then seeded this crimson clover cover crop. Right? And then she got into a cycle every year of doing crimson clover in the fall through the winter into the spring, and then when that dies, doing buckwheat right? through the summer and then doing a, a cover crop of, uh, of clover in the fall again. And this built the soil um, in a beautiful way. So by the time she got to farther parts of her yard, the soil was ready to go, and it wasn't all the weed seeds had already done their thing. Um, so I think it's really important to focus on soil. When you focus on soil, you deal with a lot less issues. Um, real quick, this is uh, one of the OGs of fer fertility making in the soil, right? The earthworm is not native, and I love the earthworm, um, but I like to make sure that people know about the dung beetle, right? Which, growing up, I only saw on, like, National Geographic in the, you know, oh, in Africa, the dung beetle, you know? But this is in my chicken coop, like, in my chicken run. That's a ball of chicken poop. And that dung beetle is rolling that, right, with its hind legs, and it's taking it down into a hole in the ground where it's going to eat it and lay its eggs. And um, basically what you have is the dung beetle move, well, it's, it got hit pretty hard by when herbicides and pesticides started being used. But it used to follow migrations of large mammals and birds, and it was basically cycling the poop. It was moving it from the ground down, right? From the ground down into the earth. Um, so they're incredibly important, and I was super excited to see them. So I like to share this. Say, the dung beetle's coming back! Um, so this is another shot of that yard with the crimson clover. And so you can see we built these beds. And then now all of this is planted with a mixture of fruit trees, shrubs, more garden. Um, and I'll tell you what, talk about restoring relationship. Neighbors would stop by and they would say, what is going on? That's incredible. It's gorgeous, right? And then she got to have a conversation about what was going on there. There we go. Doesn't matter how big or small, right? We have very humble beginnings. We started by building garden beds, you know, small garden beds, and now we're full service design build. But I like to say, you know, it's really not important how big or small it is. And really, as, you'll, as I'll talk about pretty soon, um, I think it's actually important to start small. Um, and of course, like, you know, we started building bigger gardens with deer fence protection so that the deer doesn't just eat your garden, you know? But of course, if you're gonna build a fence, you might as well grow things on it, right? Um, why build a fence just to have a fence? Why not use it as a trellis as well? Um, front yard gardens, that's probably my favorite because talk about restoring relationship. Anytime we've done a front yard garden, inevitably I hear about how the neighbors have stopped by and said, wow, this is incredible. Like, I didn't even realize you could grow those things here, right? Um, and all of a sudden it starts building relationships and then people want to protect and restore the land. Another front yard garden. Uh, this one is really close to Music Row, and it was amazing how we would be working on building this, this stone wall, this stone garden bed, and people would walk by and they would be like, wow, you know, they would be running with their headphones in and they'd be like, wow, you know, it was like, okay, cool. Um, this is the same picture with the garden in full, and I wanted to show this. I'll talk about this plant a little later, but this was all grass, and we removed the grass and planted a ground cover called mazes, M-A-Z-U-S. We're experimenting with it, and so far we've had really good results as a replacement to lawn because it doesn't grow taller than this. You don't have to mow it. You can, can run on it. You can walk on it. You can roll on it, right? It's wonderful, and it flowers. So it's kind of a win, 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 win. Um, here's another example of an edible landscape, right? It looks more like a traditional landscape, but most of the plants in here are edible, whether it's to humans, to birds, to butterflies, to other pollinators, to the soil. <clears throat> Another example, does anybody know what these big grasses are here? Say again? They're not, they're not sedges, they're actually, it's a good guess, right? I, sometimes I get pompous grass, right? It's actually lemongrass, yeah. So here's a wonderful edible plant that you can make soups and teas out of that is beautiful. I mean, it, it'll get this big, right? And of course it dies back in the winter, but hey, you just replant it and you get this. And it's hyssop. I just like talking about this plant because it's one of my good friends. Uh, it's one of our native mints. And uh, it doesn't spread like mint. It will spread, but not like mint. And it's hyssop. And uh, it, was, uh, it, it, it makes great tea. Um, you can use it in, in for culinary cooking. Um, it was used in, uh, in Native American herbology to cure 
uh, low spirits and broken hearts. And I'm sure we all know people with low spirits and broken hearts. So it's an important plant to offer as a gift. Um, here's an example in a parking lot. This is for a restaurant that kind of wanted to uh, activate some space to be able to grow some food um, and also cover up kind of this ugly uh, uh, machines back there. So, you know, we focused a lot on herbs and edible flowers because that's something they had a hard time getting. And then we did this trellis of uh, muscadine grapes. And last year they got an awesome harvest off of this, just this small space here. So small space right in a parking lot. Um, and, you know, they have to go out and clean up the cigarette butts and other trash that blows in there. But, you know, it's a good service to do anyways. Um, this is an example of just this strip right between this, uh, these driveways here, right, that is loaded with, with, uh, with edible and perennial flowers, restoring relationship. These two neighbors didn't really talk to each other. I mean, they waved when they would come outside of their garage, you know, hey, how's it going, right? This got installed. Now they spend hours having beautiful conversations as they weed this little area right between here. All of a sudden now they've restored the relationship between neighbors. <clears throat> Another example of restoring relationship with the pollinators that are around us, right? So this is a pollinator garden that we planted. Now, a lot of these flowers are edible and medicinal, but for the most part, the purpose of this garden here is to offer to our neighbors, the non-human neighbors around us. Um, this is a, a large meadow that we did. So uh, it's, it's foundation of pecans on each corner, um, and then these are all meadow plants all in between with native grasses. Right? Um, to kind of help recreate the savanna ecosystem that used to be around all through the East Coast because you'd have large uh, herds of uh, bison that would migrate. Um, and it would actually create these open areas with large trees, but then openness on, in, in between with lots of perennial flowers and grasses. <clears throat> An example of a, a more courtyard setting, kind of a little more formal, but almost everything you see in here is edible. So there's pear trees, plum trees, asparagus, onions, garlic. There's a, a, a hardy kiwi vine that's growing along there. A lot of these plants I'll talk about uh, in a short bit. Um, and then some other plants that are just ground covers, like your hellebores and things that are not edible, but work to uh, uh, lower the maintenance of this place. Um, chiropractic office. I love a doctor that grows food and offers it to the, to the patients when they come. Um, and, you know, this was a system we designed to help maximize the efficiency of water use, right? Because there's a gutter downspout that comes right here and dumped a ton of water. So we dug out a rain garden, right? So we excavated the soil, put in uh, gravel and then sandy compost soil. So the water comes into here, right? And we planted it with a um, uh, uh, fruiting shrub and, and flowers. So it soaks up that water. And then there's, when there is overflow, and I promise you there's overflow, um, the overflow then flows into this pathway that runs in this garden here, and it's a perforated, uh, a perforated corrugated pipe with a sleeve on it to make sure dirt doesn't get in. And so, so all of a sudden, this garden is passively irrigated every time it rains, and the cool thing is that because water molecules are hydrophilic, right, so they stick together, capillary action, right, you actually can create mini reservoirs, mini aquifers underneath your landscape by soaking it in instead of allowing it just to run off. It, auto, it also mitigates flood, and drought, um, which we seem to see here. Uh, here's an example of Fort Campbell military base installation. Um, lots of garden beds, and then back here is lots of fruit trees and perennial flowers. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to get back and take an updated picture because they tighten security, and when I pull up and I say, hey, I helped with the garden here, they're like, nah. <laughs> yeah? yeah I don't think they, kept it up. they didn't keep it up. Well, that makes maybe why they didn't want me to be there. Ah, oh, okay, well, I'll pretend like they did and keep talking about it, because it's, insp it's inspiring, right? Yeah. Um, here's another example. Over here, this was, it was very wet and mucky, and after a rain, you could barely walk through. Well, we dug it out like three feet deep, put a bunch of rubble, and then topped it with a nice gravel and flagstone and plants. And even after these big rains, this has been a couple years now, um, it's, it's maintained its integrity. So, you know, creative... Uh, problem solving, right? What seems like a horrible situation can really be turned into a beautiful one. It just takes some design um, and intention. Another example of a rain garden, this was washing out real bad, um, dug a rain garden here and planted a variety of wildflowers and a hardy citrus, which I will talk about shortly. Um, rain catchment catches all this water here, flows into the overflow, always need an overflow, um, which goes into the front yard and has this dry creek. Another 
example of a situation where neighbors would stop and be like, what is going on? Especially because this client planted this with all kinds of different veggies, and it was one of her most productive gardens. Um, just an example of something we've been playing with, trying to evolve the elements of a, of, of a landscape, right? We have a lot of clients who, oh, I have a play set, and well, the kids grow, grew out of it, and now we're trying to figure out what to do with this play set, you know? And we said, well, dang, shouldn't like these kind of elements like a play set evolve with the family? So we designed this so that right now it's a play set, but as the kids grow out of it, this can then become a plant trellis, right? This can all be converted to plant trellis, or we have an example of where it could be turned into a chicken coop. So all of a sudden now, what was a play set can evolve. Or this can be turned into a, a nice porch swing, right, with, with trellising on the side. So just trying to activate these spaces for the long term. Another example of it um, with these hexagonal beds that we've been installing, kind of using the, uh, the bees and the way they build honeycombs as a model for gardening. The process. So I'm kind of flying through this because I've got a lot of information to cover and I want to hit some questions. So. Um, so let's go into the process. Design, right? So I find design to be very important. Um, a lot of what we do are helping uh, clients to design their landscapes. And I say helping them because really we're just facilitating the designer in them, right? Everyone, every human is designer. We design what clothes we're going to wear when we get out of bed. We design what breakfast we're going to eat, right? We're all designers. Um, it's just facilitating that in an environment that a lot of us don't feel as confident in. So the most important thing to do if, when thinking about or when designing a landscape is just play and explore. It's amazing what will emerge when you spend time in your yard, in your landscape, right? I have a friend who's an herbalist, and she moved to a piece of property, and she said, hey, I really want to grow this plant, this plant, and this plant. And I said, well, before you, you know, she's like, where do I plant that? And I'm like, well, take some time. I'll actually allow parts of your yard to just grow. Like, just let them grow and see what happens. Well, she did that, and two out of the three plants that she wanted to grow ended up just growing wild, right? So spend some time, experiment, allow, allow the landscape to take on its own uh, personality. Assemble a team, right? Whether it's grandparents, parents, kids, friends, family, neighbors, right? Kids are some of the best designers I know because they don't limit themselves by, well, you can't, you're not, you can't do that or you can't grow that. They don't, they're just like, well, what about this? And hey, we could try that, we could try that. You know, so kids are really great designers a lot of times because they don't limit um, by what we think or, th or don't think can happen. Play more, the design will emerge, right? So assemble your team and then go outside and play. See how you move in the landscape. See how you circulate in the landscape. And then start sketching patterns to details. Don't start with, you know, okay, well, I really want a plum tree here and I really want a blueberry here. Start with the big patterns, right? Okay, pathway goes there, right? I want to do my veggie garden here. I want to do an orchard here. I want to do a play set here. I want to do a bench here, right? So start with the patterns and then move towards the details. And know the design will evolve. Even after we finish a, 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 a very complex design, we still tell the client, like, it is going to evolve, right? This is not in concrete. Like, as you do things, the design will evolve. Start small, right? Start with a couple garden beds. Start with one fruit tree that you maintain really well, right? A lot of success can be found in just maintaining one area, right? And so this is an Asian persimmon fruit tree that I'll talk about soon with some of the guild plants that you can plant to help increase pollination, increase nutrient availability. Um, and I'll talk about some of those soon as well. Remove the sod. So I like to talk about this because sometimes that's a question I get like, well, you know, we've got all this grass. This is um, probably one of the most used and favorite tools that we have, a sod cutter. Um, we got robbed recently, and this was the one that I was the most worried about, but of course it's so heavy that the, the robber couldn't get it very far, so I ended up finding it. Um, yes. um, but anyways, it, you, you, it has this blade and it cuts, and you can see it just creates this clean strip that you have to, you have to make sure it's not too wet and not too dry, but basically you can go two and a half inches two and a half or three inches deep, and then the sod just rolls right up, right? And then you can take that, and I usually take it home and give it to my chickens, and the chickens love picking through all the sod. Um, but you can also use hose. Um, I buy hose from easydigging.com. They have special hose for removing sod. So it just depends on how much. Home Depot does rent these, um, as well as other local rental places. So if you are gonna remove sod, I highly recommend getting one of those. Um, loosen and amend the soil. So some of the soil amendments we use are compost, right? So the compost company has good compost. Uh, there's mushroom compost you can find at a lot of places, leaf compost. 
Um, but compost is, is really one of the primary ingredients of good soil. Trace minerals, azomite, this is a product. Uh, a to Z of minerals, including trace elements. So it is very important for um, some of the things you're not going to get from compost. And that's what you'll find is that plants will become susceptible to pests and diseases, even if it seems like the soil's doing really well because they're missing some trace minerals and elements, right, that help boost their immune system and actually allow them to fight off diseases. Um, gypsum, which helps just loosen soil. So we use gypsum a lot um, because it breaks up clay soils. Green sand does a similar um, thing. It also breaks up clay soils, but it also adds potassium and iron, which is potassium especially good for uh, growing roots out. Biotone is a, another product that we use for mostly planting woody trees uh, and, and shrubs. Um, it's, it doesn't have a lot of nitrogen in it, which I like. So if you're going to plant uh, trees and shrubs like in the fall through the winter, you don't want to put something with nitrogen in it because nitrogen promotes leaf growth and you don't want to do that in the winter. You only want to use that nitrogen in the spring and sometimes in the summer. For woody plants, it's kind of off the screen here, but mycorrhizae, which is one of the oldest terrestrial relationships known, right? It's between a fungus and a plant and the fungus basically integrates itself into the root and it receives sugars from the plants through photosynthesis and the fungus has this really fine network of threads that spreads out, much finer than the root, so it's able to take up water and nutrients from the soil way more efficiently than the roots and it gives that to the plant. So it's this really beautiful dance. Um, and so you can buy like an inoculant that you put on the roots of woody plants, highly recommend it. And then cover crops, as I kind of already talked about, um, real quick, this is a broad fork, which is also a great tool. It's a big, basically big, like, fork that you step on and it loosens soil. We till, like, when we first establish a garden, but I'm not really a fan of tilling over and over again because it actually can create a hard pan and it actually destroys the soil structure. So I'm much more in favor of once the garden is established and once the edible landscape is established, using a broad fork to help just loosen the soil and you can put compost and use that to amend. And then plant. Make sure to cut the roots of root-bound plants. If you ever take a tree or a, or a perennial plant and take the pot off and the roots are real bound like this, just take a sharp knife or a sharp trowel and just cut along the sides because what will happen is a lot of times those roots will keep, wind, will keep winding around each other and you won't, the plant won't thrive because uh, the roots haven't had, they haven't been facilitated to grow out. Um, and then apply a, a layer of mulch. I like pine straw or pine fines. Um, pine finds more in a garden than a landscape because it will disappear pretty quickly. Ground leaves are great. Or ground covers, and I'm going to talk about some ground covers that we use here pretty shortly. Protect. So obviously fencing is a great way to protect, but that's not always the best option. Um, this is castor plant, right? Castor bean plant, which of course castor oil comes from. One of the best deterrents for moles and voles in underground varmint, right? It releases a chemical from its roots that um, underground vermin don't like. So you can plant it around your landscape uh, and it will help repel a lot of those underground um, creatures. Um, this is wormwood, which we've used successfully to, def uh, I'm, I'll use the word defend against rabbits, right? Rabbits don't seem to, to, to be attracted to the wormwood set. They actually repelled by it. And I say that all of this by saying that, you know, all, all rabbits are not the same, right? I had a whole garden that rabbits were infesting, planted wormwood all around it, not one more garden, uh, no, not one more rabbit issue, right? The rabbits wouldn't come near the garden. I did this in another garden, and the rabbits were eating the wormwood. <laughs> right, so I just offer that, just like none of us are, all, are exactly the same, none of, none of the, no plant or no animal is exactly the same, right? No rabbit is exactly the same, so you kind of have to experiment. All right, per beautiful perennial food plants. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the ones that we've tested that we have found to be neglect tolerant. Right? That's important for us, is to have foods that are neglect tolerant, because if you can neglect it and it still grows and is healthy and produces food, well, dang, that's great. Um, so these are some of the ones that we've tested. Nanking cherry um, is a bush cherry. There's other types of bush cherries that seem to do really well here. This is the one that we've tested the most. Beautiful spring flowers. Um, Cherries the size of about a dime, so they're on the smaller side, but they're really tasty. They're a nice mixture of sweet and sour. Um, you know, the birds like them, but they don't seem to, like, ravage the bush. Um, all, all, all our clients that have them um, seem to always get somewhat of a harvest, um, sometimes very abundant harvest. 
Um, I actually presented uh, a similar presentation at a master gardening group, I think in Dixon. And after I got done, a fellow came up and he said, man, I have a spot in my yard that for seven years I tried something different. And I came across the Nanking cherry because everything else had died, right? For seven years he planted something new and everything died. He came across the Nanking cherry, planted that in the ground, and it thrived. And so he was totally won over by the Nanking cherry. And it confirmed to me that it is a very neglect-tolerant plant. Of course, after seven years of things dying, that soil might have been real fertile at that point. I'm not sure. <laughs> Elderberry, um, one of our wonderful native uh, fruiting plants, uh, gets to be a pretty big bush, um, pretty dang big, um, though you can whack it back almost all the way to the ground, and it will still come back every year. Um, big blossoms, that's my hand. I have a pretty big hand, so pretty big uh, white blossoms. And then berries, um, that, these big clusters of small purple berries. Now, you don't really want to eat them fresh. They're not that great. But you can make them into jams and jellies and also wine, right? So when I started learning about this, I had learned that this was one of the best immune-boosting plants, good for flu prevention. And one day, I get a call from my dad, and he says, hey, Jay. <clears throat> I just was watching Dr. Oz, and he was talking all about how elderberry was one of the best flu prevention and immune boosting plants out there. And I was like, all right, affirmation, you know? And so that also affirmed to me that making wine out of it is great because you can actually drink the wine and get a buzz and boost your immune system at the same time. <laughs> win win, right? Beautyberry, another one of our native um, understory plants. This plant will grow in full shade, part shade, full sun. Um, so really easy for a lot of places. If you have a part of your yard and you're like, I just don't know what to fill that in with, elderberry or beautyberry is great. Actually, let me go back really quick to elderberry. It will spread. So do not put elderberry in a place where you're like, I just want you to stay right there because elderberry will say, nope, whoop, whoop, whoop. So definitely plant elderberry in a place where it can spread its wings a little bit, as they say. And it also, ideally, you want a couple of different elderberries for good pollination. Beautyberry, um, Another one you can actually whack back and it will grow back every year. Um, beautiful purple berries that persist into the winter, like even into December. Um, and actually the, the berries are edible. Um, they have like a subtle nutty flavor that are really good. This, this year I got a picture from some clients uh, of a jelly that they had made from it. And I was like, success! Um, so really great, like I said, one you can just fill in holes wherever you need a, 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 something that's going to, to basically occupy that space, but also produce beauty and food. Um, the leaves are good, um, were used by natives to, um, uh, to rub, they would crush the leaf and rub it on their skin to, re to repel like mosquitoes and other insects, other biting insects. So um, it's, I, I'm just waiting for someone to make like a, you know, mosquito repellent from Beautyberry. Um, Rosa rugosa, um, also known as Japanese rose, so not, not, a, not a native, but um, I find this to be one of the few roses that really grow well here. It doesn't get the rose rosette, which is a disease that's going around, and even knockout roses, which were bred to be um, resistant, are getting knocked out by that disease. So, um, so far, no diseases. Um, it will grow to be a pretty big shrub. There's white and pink varieties. The roses smell great. And like as many of you know, knockout roses don't have really a smell. These have a really nice fragrance. I remember I gave a similar presentation, and a lady said, you know, a, a rose without a smell is like a bad date. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's truth. So great smell and great fruit, right? They're about the size of a cherry tomato or so, um, a little smaller, and they taste good. You can eat them fresh, but you can also make jams, jellies, and you can dry them for tea, right? If you look at, um, next time you're at the, the grocery store, look at, the, you know, look at the, the supplements and look up the vitamin C, and a lot of times you'll see vitamin C with rose hips, right? So very f packed with vitamin C. So a really good one to add that's also very tasty. Will also spread like the elderberry. Not as aggressively, but will definitely fill a space, uh, 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 will fill a space well. Muscadine grape, here's an arbor with muscadine growing on it. Um, I really like um, uh, planting muscadine grape and even kiwi in a place where you might have a pergola. And it's a place you would want shade in the summer, but in the winter, it, loses its leaves, and that sun comes right through when you want it in the winter. So it's a nice one where you want some shade in the summer and, and, and sun in the, in the winter. Um, you know, I only find that there's, 
really, we only plant three grapes in Middle Tennessee, Muscadine, Scuppernong, and Concord. Those are the only ones I have found to be successful. I had a client who said, you know, I've tested, every, he tested every single grape he could find except for those three, and none of them were successful. Um, so that's unfortunate for him. Um, but it also affirmed to me that like, you know, I'm just going to stick with these three grapes. Um, they're wonderful. Kusa dogwood, that's K-O-U-S-A. Um, so very similar to the native dogwood. Now, unfortunately, the native dogwood is getting the disease and um, I'm seeing it around and it's starting to, they're slowly starting to die off. This one is resistant uh, to the disease. Uh, beautiful flowers that look just like the native dogwood with these fruits that are about the size of a cherry tomato. The outside texture is a little weird, it's a little bumpy, but the inside pulp is absolutely delicious. Um, will grow in full shade, part shade, full sun, so it's a really good uh, understory tree for many places. Um, and it's beautiful, it's used a lot actually in landscaping, like they actually planted a bunch around the new Skimmerhorn Symphony Hall. Last time I was there I was popping fruits and people were looking at me weird, but you know, I didn't want to spend an arm and a leg on concessions, so. Um, just waiting for that voice to disappear. Service berry, one of our native fruits, or tree form, shrub form, right? This is a tree form. A lot of nurseries, when they sell it, well, they'll make it a single stem, but it likes to grow actually as a multi-stem. Beautiful spring flowers, nice fall colors, and then these berries that are about the size of a blueberry. They taste like a mixture between a plum and an almond. I love them, they're so good. Um, it will grow in really wet soils. It will grow in really dry soils. It likes part shade, it likes full sun. So another one that can go in a variety of areas. Um, like I said, there's a tree form. There's also a shrub form that will only grow about this tall and will kind of spread out and produces really, like I said, the fruits are really good. Birds do like them, um, but plant enough of them and there'll be plenty for everyone. Asian persimmon. So this is probably my favorite fruit for Middle Tennessee. I love American persimmons, but as many of you know, if you eat them before they're ripe, well, it's not the most enjoyable experience. Um, also, they get to be pretty tall trees, and the fruits, you know, that when they drop, they kind of are real soft, which is when you want to eat them. The Asian persimmon, which is grafted onto the American persimmon rootstock, so it's very well adapted here. Um, basically, you can have trees that are 12 feet tall, 15 feet tall, 20 feet tall. So for the most part, they're a smaller tree, really beautiful fall colors, and fruits. Now, the non-astringent varieties, Fuyu is one of my favorites. It's about the size of an apple, and you can eat it while it's still hard. You can slice it into pieces. Um, you can dehydrate it. Um, so think of that persimmon flavor, but in a much more easily accessible form. So um, I love them. I think they're great. And they ripen over like a month or two. So we have one that we'll go and we'll harvest some from one week, eat them. And two weeks later, we go harvest a couple more. A couple weeks later, we go harvest some more. So it spreads the harvest out, and they hang on there like little ornaments. So it's just beautiful. So um, really a good tree for small spaces, like I said, because you can get varieties that are more compact. Fuyu, F-U-Y-U. There's a bunch of other varieties out there. That's the one that I've planted a lot of that seems to do great. Um, you know, if you're more, a little more north, they are li they're cold sensitive. So, you know, we're just getting to the point where they seem to do really well here. Um, but if you're, if you're in, you know, if you're one zone below us, you definitely want to put it in an area, maybe along a wall or somewhere where it's going to get some good thermal mass. Um, if you plant it way out in a field, it might not do so well. Um, Self-fertile as well, so you only need one, which is really nice. Vitex. Um, this is a wonderful um, flowering tree. Um, this is one when someone's like, oh, I love crepe myrtles, but I already have 750 of them. I need another tree that has a similar form that I can plant. And Vitex is great. It's got beautiful bark, multi-trunked, it can be single-trunked. It flowers for months, and it is one of the top uh, pollinator nectaries, right? So bees and other pollinators love this plant. When it's in bloom, you're going to see all kinds of plants around it, or all kinds of pollinators, yeah. I, I think so. Yeah, like violets, you can make jelly out of the, out of the flowers. Um, the fruits are um, a good medicine. Um, you can see they're popular for women. Um, but, you know, I mean, you're, you'll see these in, like, Kroger's in public. So this is pretty well-known uh, medicine um, for regulating hormones. Um, it, you can also use the fruit in, for culinary purposes. It's got, like, a very subtle, nutty flavor. 
Um, but just a beautiful tree will grow about 15 to 20 feet, sometimes 25 feet. You can whack it, if you want to keep it as a bush, you can whack it back to the ground and it, will, and it will come out like a bush and it will still flower. So even if you have a tight space where you don't need a full size tree, this is a really great one. I try to put this one in almost every landscape because it is really one of the best pollinator plants and it blooms for months and it's beautiful. Papa, so I already sang my Papa song. Um, this is just a wonderful plant, um, one of our native fruits. It is an understory plant. So if you are going to plant a pawpaw, be very considerate of how much sun it's getting. Because if you plant a young pawpaw right out in the middle of a full sun field, it might not make it, right? Because it evolved in the understory, these big old leaves, right? So it really ideally needs shade for the first like year or two of its life. Then once it, once it establishes itself, it can be in full sun, no problem. Um, so just consider that. You, know, you might even plant it where you're going to plant like sunflowers to help shade it until it gets established, right? Or okra or something like that. Um, really interesting about pawpaws is uh, the flowers, anyone ever smelled a pawpaw flower? Right, it's very unique. Yeah, it's not like nice and floral. It smells to me like kind of like a yeasty sourdough bread or something because it's not pollinated by bees. It's pollinated by flies and beetles. Okay, so it's actually attracting, it, it's putting out different scent because it's attracting different pollinators. So one technique that I've heard of people doing um, in more rural settings is hanging pieces of dead meat from the tree, um, rotting flesh to attract flies to increase pollination. None of my clients have ticked me up on that offer yet, um, which is totally understandable. Um, but you know, the idea is you want to attract those flies and beetles. Another technique is to hand pollinate. You can go with a little paintbrush in a bowl and go to one flower, get a little pollen, go to the next one, and that helps increase pollination. Um, now, some of you may have wild patches on your property like we do, and that's wonderful. One thing you can go do is you can actually clear out some of the small pawpaws, right? Because pawpaws are, they sucker. They'll send out uh, roots and create these big old patch, right? Pawpaw patch. But a lot of times that might be only one actual organism, right? That's sent out a bunch of suckers. So one thing you can do is go and clear a couple of the small ones and then plant in new pawpaws that you buy from other places because genetic diversity actually helps create better fruit set. So, um, you know, if you don't have any pawpaws, you can just plant two different ones real close to each other. And for the most part, the flies and beetles will pollinate well. Hardy citrus, flying dragon. It's the only citrus that will grow here. Totally outside, no problem. Um, actually, the entire um, citrus industry grafts onto the roots of this. So um, you don't have to protect this in the winter. Um, it's got these great thorns that look beautiful. Um, wonderful citrus flowers that smell angelic. And then fruits that are about the size of a golf ball. They're not acidic like other lemons you would buy in the store. They're more fruity. They're, they definitely have like a, a stickiness to them. So, you, you know, once you're, when you process them, you're going to have to clean the thing, your utensils really well. But, you know, we use it for lemonade, hummus, salsa. I mean, we use it for all kinds of things. And I really find it to be a great addition to the landscape. I mean, lemons, come on. Um, and it's also a really great uh, protection fence or hedge, right? If you have an area where you want to put a fence, but you don't really want the look of a fence, nothing will penetrate this. Right? You plant, because, so let me back up and say the flying dragon, it only gets about six to eight feet tall, right? So really nice, more compact, whereas the straight species, just the hardy citrus, Ponsiris trifoliata, is it will grow 15 to 20 feet, so huge. But if you plant a whole hedge of that, deer, humans, rabbits, dogs, cats, nothing will get through it because it's just thorns all the way through. Chestnut, right? So chestnuts roasting on an open fire. I mean. Right, chestnuts have a, a big part in our, in our history, right? And they were actually a staple for the native people. That's because like almonds and walnuts and pecans are really fatty and oily, right? So you eat like too many of those and you might be like, oh, indigestion, right? Where chestnuts are very starchy, they're more like a potato, so you can actually make a solid meal out of them. Um, big, nice trees, I mean, they're gonna be, you know, the, one of the bigger trees in your landscape. Um, but I think a really important neglect tolerant food, especially if we start to consider more perennial foods. I mean, I've got clients that have three chestnut trees. They don't really care for the chestnuts until we like process them and make them into popsicles and give them back to them. Then they love them. Um, but they don't touch the trees. You know, they barely even wave at them. And every year they produce hundreds of pounds of chestnuts, right? Talk about neglect tolerant foods. 
Um, so I find this to be a really important food that's being reintroduced, right? Because they're, they're taking the American and that has a blight, right? And so it's having trouble growing and they're, they're mixing in a small percentage of Chinese um, genetics to help it be more uh, disease resilient. Yeah. The actual, the, the, yeah, over time, slowly, slowly. yeah, slowly. Um, so I guess I'm going to rock through the rest of these because I don't have much more time. Perennial hibiscus grows back every year. Butterflies, hummingbirds absolutely love it. It blooms for months. I just think it's a really wonderful addition to the landscape. Um, and more, prickly pear cactus, a vegetable and a fruit in the same plant. How cool is that, right? No Nopal, yeah, no Nopal. That is the, the, the pads of these. You take the, the spines off and you have a really delicious vegetable. And then the fruits are absolutely awesome. Pomegranates are just able to survive here. We've got, I've got clients that are actually getting pomegranates on their pomegranate bush. Hardy kiwi, the size of cherry tomatoes, right, but without all the fuzz. They love to grow here and you can just pop them and they're just so, so freaking good. Um, rue, nice evergreen. Really good for the pollinators. Um, grows about this tall. Traditionally, in the Americas, down into South America, was planted near the entranceway of houses to ward off evil spirits. We all need that, don't we? Wax myrtle, nice evergreen. This is our bay, right? So if you like bay for cooking, wax myrtle will survive here, no problem. Nice big evergreen. Really good for privacy if you need a place to get a little privacy. Will grow 8 to 10 feet, up to 15, depending on if it likes its situation but really, really a great alternative for bay. And then, of course, passion fruit. Passion flower is our Tennessee state wildflower, right? Iris is the Tennessee state flower. The passion flower is the Tennessee state wildflower. So one, a great native. Um, the fruit is absolutely delicious, um, especially when it ripens all the way. And the flowers make a really good tea. If you have anxiousness or you can't sleep, you can make tea out of the flower, and it will um, it'll just lull you into a beautiful bliss. Um, around fruit trees, I recommend comfrey. Um, which will act as basically a living mulch. Bee balm, which will, is an edible and medicinal flower, but will attract lots of pollinators and actually you know, take up a lot of space to prevent weeds. And yarrow, which is similar to both of these. It will help increase pollination, but will also um, bring nutrients from deep in the soil and give it to the tree. Ground covers. Mazes, I was talking about this one earlier, will spread. You can do white or purple flowering. Um, good alternative to lawn. Ajuga, another good alternative for an area where you want something to take over. Um, it, it mostly stays like this, this tall until it flowers and it gets a flower stalk that goes like this, but it doesn't last long. And um, really hardy, you can run on it, walk on it, roll on it. Um, Creeping Jenny, um, also edible, right? Nice tart flavor, you can mix that into salads. Um, a nice place to fill in where you don't want weeds. And then, of course, thyme is a really great one, the short one. Um, edible mushrooms, incorporate those into the edible landscape. Um, these are some of the ones that we use a lot. I know there is uh, Hinosis Mushrooms is selling these mushroom logs here at the Lawn and Garden Show pre-inoculated. Um, and you just want to find the right spot for them, which they can tell you all about them. Um, this is just a cool tree. So this is me, and you can see we're talking hundreds of pounds of oyster mushrooms. Abundance is all around us, um, and, and it hides. Um, so resources. Uh, National Foodscapes, that's us. Uh, compost tea for fertility. Hidden Springs Nursery, Rockbridge Nursery. Hinosis, I just talked about in Compost Nashville for food waste collection. Um, and then I've got five minutes, so this is my last slide. I'm gonna, I'm gonna now take some questions, but I'd just like to quote Matsunobu Fukuoka, a, a wonderful Japanese farmer and philosopher. The ultimate goal of farming is not the growing of crops, but the cultivation and perfection of human beings. Naturalfoodscapes.com is the name of the website. Um, and I'll stick around if you want to come up and, and ask questions. I have cards if, 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 you, want to, if you want to take home a, a card so that you have my info. Thank you all so much. Appreciate it.